It's a pleasure to welcome this morning a, a good friend, uh, a colleague in ministry, John Burgess, professor of systematic theology at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Two years ago, in the midst of uh, pandemic isolation, when we were brand new to Zoom, uh, John joined us uh, from Pittsburgh and uh, gave an online talk about the alternative politics in the Russian Orthodox Church in Putin's Russia. This morning, he is here to help us understand and to explore how President Putin and Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church, the leader of that church, have drawn on Russian Orthodox religious motifs to justify the invasion of Ukraine. John will also examine how God may be calling us, the American church, to respond to the conflict. Prior to joining Pittsburgh Seminary uh, on the faculty in 1998, John was professor and chaplain at Doan College, Presbyterian affiliated college in the Midwest. And then he was associate for theology in our denomination's Office of Theology and Worship in the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, that was the same office where I was working for IQ, Presbyterian minister, and has served several congregations on a part time uh, parish associate and other basis. Um, he is the author of Holy Rus, The Rebirth of Orthodoxy in the New Russia, published a few years ago by Yale University Press, and he shared insights from that book a couple of years ago, and his talk is available online if you're interested in taking a look at that, if you missed it. And he's also written numerous other books, uh, including Encounters with Orthodoxy, How Protestant Churches Can Reform Themselves Again, Confessing Our Faith, The Book of Confessions for Church Leaders, after Baptism, Shaping the Christian Life, Why Scripture Matters, Reading the Bible in the Time of Church Conflict, and the East German Church and the End of Communism. John spent some time in the former East Germany, and actually was in East Germany when the wall came down. So uh, John has led a very interesting life. Uh, he was a Fulbright, Fulbright Scholar in Russia in 2011, and again in 2018-2019. He applied for a Fulbright for this coming year, uh, but the Russians said probably not. <laughs> but these awards have uh, supported his current research on the Russian Orthodox Church in post-communist Russia and uh, give him a, really an important insight into what's going on right now. John and I first met, oh, some 25 years ago after both of us had graduated from the same small liberal arts college in Colorado Springs where we managed never to cross paths or at least know each other. It's a, it's a large world when it's a small world. That's a story in and of itself. Suffice it to say that the trajectory of my life and vocation made a significant shift and eventually came to intersect with what had been John's for a much longer time. John and I have been part of a group uh, of theological friends who have been meeting together regularly for the past 17 years uh, to think and pray about the future of the church in the context of daily worship. And that group has been one of the most foreign, formative and important influences in my life. And John has been an integral part of these conversations. And so um, it's just, uh, he has just the utmost um, integrity uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, really brings an authority in what he has to say pretty much about everything uh, to us this morning. We also share a common membership on the board of directors of the Center for Catholic and Evangelical Theology um, and lots and lots of common interests. With John this morning, who wasn't with him, at least online two years ago, is his wife, Deb. And we're delighted to have her with us. Uh, and without further ado, let's welcome John Burgess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quinn and, Quinn and Quinn and Nancy for their hospitality to us this weekend. Good to be with all of you and to think together out of a Christian context about some of these events that are weighing so heavily on our hearts as we read the news about Russia and Ukraine. So that will be my focus this morning. How do we as Christians understand what's going on? I'm not a political scientist, though I'm very interested in what the political scientists are saying, but inviting us to think theologically, inviting us to think out of our faith, 
first about how people of faith in that part of the world are thinking about the conflict, but then also to draw on some of our Christian theological resources about war and military conflict to try to frame this conflict in a way that might give us insight into how we respond as Christians. As Quinn said, my wife and I have lived in Russia several times as I've had Fulbright scholarships, most recently in 2018 to 19 when we lived in a provincial town called Belgorod, Belgorod, Russia, which is only about 20 miles from the Ukrainian border. And little did we know that four years later, we would be seeing pictures of Belgorod and Belgorod province on the front page of the New York Times. That was one of the areas where the Russian military began to build up as it prepared for the invasion of Ukraine. And Belgorod itself has experienced several rocket attacks from the side of the Ukrainians. We stay in touch with friends there, with acquaintances, some of whom are, are very pro-Putin and others of whom uh, find this to be a complete catastrophe and disaster for their nation. So we try to stay in touch. We try to communicate as well as we can, though that's very difficult right now. As you probably know, political repression is quite heavy in Russia. It's very difficult for people to speak openly about what they're experiencing, how they're reacting. But we try to read between the lines and simply try to stay in touch. We see this as part of our Christian commitment to just to keep some channels of communication open, not to use our texting and messaging to condemn the war, to condemn President Putin, as uh, strong as our feelings may be about that, but simply to say as Christians, we're thinking about you. We continue to pray. We continue to want to be in touch with you. So we can talk more about that, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. Let's launch in first to the situation in Ukraine and some historical context for that. So here's our map of Europe and the location of Ukraine between its big neighbor there on the screen to the, the right, the, the Russia, but you can also see how Ukraine is located in the almost center of, of Europe, surrounded by other Central European nations, and then to the south, the, the Black Sea and uh, Greece and Turkey. And this is significant to understand Ukraine because the very word Ukraine probably means borderlands, on the border, on the edge. Ukraine is a, an area of the, the world that has always been between the great empires. Ukraine has suffered mightily on uh, account of this, invasions, invaders from all different sides. So to the, the right there, there have been times when Ukraine has been dominated by Russia, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union. There are other times earlier in history where much of Ukraine was dominated by Poland and the Poland, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, to the south, uh, across the Black Sea, there have been cultural influences from Greece. And even Romania, there are portions of Ukraine where people speak Romanian as their first language. Ukraine, a country, a, 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 a group of people between the great European powers, and this has determined a lot of Ukrainian history. How do we find nationhood? Is there a distinctive Ukrainian nation when Ukraine has been dominated by these competing European powers. This also means that Ukraine has been historically a nation of different regions. So to the east, and we've been reading a lot about the current battles in the eastern part of Ukraine, 
a traditionally Russian-speaking portion of the country, whereas Central and especially uh, Western Ukraine, much more dominated by, by Poland and a Polish variation of uh, a form of Ukrainian that's much closer to, to the Polish language. So these various cultural linguistic influence, influences mean that, that Ukraine has never had a strong sense of national identity until sometime in the 19th century when Ukrainian did begin to emerge as a literary language and there were efforts to unify the country as a distinctive Ukraine. The current battles in Ukraine, having shifted from around Kiev, the, the capital, are now in the eastern Russian-speaking part of Ukraine, especially the area that's known as the Donbass, there to the, the very eastern part, Luhansk and Donetsk. You can see how much territory the Russians are now occupying, nearly 20% of Ukraine, and forming what's called a, a land bridge between Russia and Crimea, which the Russians had already annexed in 2014 after the Maidan revolution in Ukraine, where a pro-Russian president was deposed, had to flee the country, and a pro-Western government was installed. So these uh, portions, these Russian-speaking portions to the east, where the Russian military is now concentrating its, uh, its manpower, its uh, missile attacks, and so on. And this is uh, also an area that is dominated by Orthodox Christianity. One of the realities of Ukraine, because it's been so... Uh, dominated by different regions is that the western part of Ukraine, the part that was more strongly dominated by Poland and Lithuania, has a stronger Catholic presence, presence Greek uh, Catholic. These are, are Ukrainians who uh, worship in a Eastern Orthodox style, but are formally under Rome, under the Pope. Whereas to the east, where the battles are taking place, these are uh, Orthodox, and Orthodox who for several hundred years have been formally associated with the Moscow Patriarchate. So this very complicated situation that we have Ukrainians, some of whom, they're, they're all worshiping basically in the same way, the same style of worship, some associated with Rome, some associated with Ma, and then since uh, 2019, there's been an independent Ukrainian church in the middle. So these three groups, all Orthodox, all tracing their heritage back to the conversion of this part of the world to Orthodoxy in 988, but competing churches now within Ukraine, some more pro-West, others more pro-East. Well, President Putin gave a speech on February 21st to the nation, preparing the nation for war. This was an hour long tirade where he rehearsed more than a thousand years of history. We uh, Americans have problems rehearsing history for more than a decade or two. <laughs> President Putin uh, went back to this event in 988 AD when Prince Vladimir, or if you're Ukrainian, you call him Prince Volodymyr, uh, in 988 was converted from paganism to that form of Christianity and Byzantium that we sometimes call Eastern Christianity. Putin referred to this event and said that ever since then, ever since 988, for more than a thousand years, Ukrainians and Russians have been one people. We've come out of a common baptism, out of a common event when the prince of the Eastern Slavs converted to Christianity. 
And for a millennium, Ukrainians and Russians have shared Orthodox architecture, Orthodox art, literature influenced by Orthodoxy. This common heritage is what Putin kept referring to and his resentment that the West is trying to break Ukraine off, break it away from that common heritage that Russians and Ukrainians have shared. This uh, place in Crimea, Kherson, is where that baptism took place in 988. You can make pilgrimage to it today, see the site where presumably Prince Vladimir was baptized. The story goes, there's a legend about this, that Prince Vladimir was considering which religion would be right for him and his people. And he sent emissaries out to the surrounding empires of the world to bring that report. Some came back from Islamic countries and said, Islam is a great religion. And the, the people bow down to Allah and are obedient to their ruler. But there's one problem, Prince Vladimir, they don't drink. And Prince Vladimir said, that's not a good religion for me and my people. So Islam was ruled out, and for other reasons, Judaism was ruled out, and Western Catholicism, and Prince Vladimir listened to the emissaries who had come back from Constantinople, where they had worshipped in the church of the great Hagia Sophia. And there they said, during the liturgy, the, 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 the beauty the icons, the chanting, the incense was so overwhelming. We no longer knew whether we were on earth or in heaven. And that vision of beauty, uh, the transfiguration of the world is, according to the legend, what drew Prince Vladimir to orthodoxy. It, it didn't hurt that it also created a military alliance between him and the Byzantium Empire. So this uh, artistic rendering of Prince Vladimir being baptized, in those days, by the way, people were baptized in the nude and went into the baptismal waters all the way down three times. So uh, not sure how this would work at national if you <laughs> return to the practice of the early church. And then uh, Prince Vladimir returned to Kiev, his hometown, and he had his warriors and their families baptized in mass here in the Dnieper River that flows through Kiev. But you can see already, as I alluded to, that this history that Russians allude to, one people, one culture, one heritage since 988. Of course, Ukrainians tell from a different perspective. And so for them, it's not Vladimir, but Volodymyr. For them, it is not Kiev, but Kiev. Ukrainians have had their own way of telling this history, how they've been dominated and persecuted and marginalized over the centuries and yet have endured as a distinctive people. By the way, this is a statue of Prince uh, Vladimir that uh, the Russians during the, the 19th century, the time of the Russian Empire, was uh, constructed above the banks of the river. This vision of beauty, if you walk into an Orthodox church and this transfer, transfiguration, this transformation of the world through beauty. In Orthodox worship, every one of your senses is engaged, but redirected, beautified, transfigured. So, as I said, you walk in and you're surrounded by the icons of Christ, Mary, the saints. All of the music is chanted. There is no instrumentation in an Orthodox church. Your sense of smell is engaged because there may be clouds of incense flowing uh, through the church. Your sense of taste, because the Eucharist is celebrated at every Orthodox liturgy. And the sense of touch, feeling, because Orthodox worship is embodied 
worship. You use your body, you bow, you kiss the icons. There are times when you make prostrations, especially during the season of Lent. And when the churches are really crowded and people are bumping up against each other and, and there, there's always uh, an elderly babushka who has to get from one side of the church to the other to light a candle to a particular saint. And we've experienced this, people elbowing us during worship to get from one side of the, the church to the other. Uh, my wife once said, orthodoxy in Russia is a contact sport. <laughs> but this use of the body, this physicality, this materiality that is transfigured, is changed, is redirected to give you the sense of stepping into heaven while you're still on earth. Well, uh, the president of the Russian Federation, Putin has, uh, as I said, appealed to this history of orthodoxy, one orthodoxy, one people, uh, one heritage, one culture. And this has also been the story that the patriarch in Moscow, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Kirill, or in Russian is pronounced as Kirill, this is a story that he also tells. So there's been this common ideology that both church and state have shared that has been propagated as a justification for the invasion of Ukraine. You know, wars are, have complicated, complicated factors behind them and very often really was foundational, fundamental to wars is the search for economic and political dominance. But then that always gets clothed in high humanistic ideals. So when Americans go to war, inevitably we talk about democracy, freedom, human rights. That's what we're fighting for, and, and that's what we say we're fighting for in Ukraine. Well, Russians too had their way of lifting up high ideals to justify what in many ways is driven by economics and political dominance. But the language that Russians use is more religiously tinged. It's the language of this common heritage and this language that we, as one people with the Ukrainians, share the same moral values. A lot of talk in Russia about traditional moral values that Russians and Ukrainians share. By that, they mean traditional sexual values, conservative sexual values, patriotism, respect for the church, respect for authority. And just as we Americans think we're battling dictatorship and authoritarianism, the Russians say, well, what we're trying to defend, what we're battling is Western individualism, Western consumerism, the moral decadence of the West. So this rhetoric that gets developed on each side that feeds into the way that we think about the war. But for Patriarch Kirill and the Russian Orthodox Church, it's not only about these high ideals, high ideals it's very much also about the institutional power of the church in Russia. For 75 years, Orthodoxy was persecuted in the Soviet Union. And by the year 1996, when Gorbachev came to power, there were only about 6,000 parishes of the Russian Orthodox Church operating in all of the Soviet Union, including, of course, at that time, Ukraine and Belarus and parts of Central Asia. 6,000 parishes, 17 monasteries, and five seminaries, right? 6,000 parishes, 17 monasteries, five seminaries in 1996. Communism falls. Gorbachev uh, eventually has to, to relinquish power. Yeltsin becomes the, the prime minister and then followed by Putin. And since that time, so since 1996, so over not quite 30 years, 
with the, the beneficence, with the support of the Russian state. Now listen to the statistics. The Russian Orthodox Church has gone from 6,000 parishes to 37,000 in less than 30 years. From 17 monasteries to almost 1,000 men and women's monasteries. From five seminaries to more than 50. And so this alliance state has been very beneficial to the Russian Orthodox Church, has allowed it to rebuild its infrastructure, has allowed it to do wonderful ministries. And my wife and I have visited some of these places where cutting edge drug rehabilitation work is taking place, where the church has founded hospices, uh, all kinds of publishing programs. There are now Orthodox television stations and radio stations and publishing houses in Russia things that would have been unimaginable under communism. Patriarch Kirill and the Russian Orthodox Church can't become a political opposition without fearing that all of that could be lost. All of that could be put in jeopardy. So understandably, as regrettably we uh, uh, think about it from a Western perspective, it's not entirely surprising that there's not only this ideological justification for one people, Russians and Ukrainians together, but also this institutional dimension of the power that the Russian Orthodox potentially would lose if it were neutral about the war or chose to oppose the war. So church and state have made common cause. Here's an example of the renewal of the Russian Orthodox Church. This is the Fyodorovsky Sabor Cathedral in St. Petersburg during the communist era. It was uh, built in 1903 uh, with uh, glorious marble cladding and golden domes taken over by the, the Soviets, uh, deconsecrated, and in the 1930s, was transformed into a milk factory. And people who grew up, I, I've met people who've grown up in St. Petersburg during the communist era, and they remember this as the place their milk came from. So then uh, with the fall of communism, eventually the church was able to get this property back. A small parish, a couple hundred people, they didn't have the financial resources to restore the church to its former glory. Who steps in? The head of President Putin's United Russia political party and says this is an important cultural monument. We're going to raise money from business and political leaders to restore it to its former glory. And that's what it looks like today. So from milk factory to magnificent, glorious, orthodox church again. Well, again, you know, how do we think about this from our own Western perspective? What, uh, what would we do if during uh, one era, National Presbyterian Church had been turned into a, a milk factory and now it was given back to us, but it could only be restored with the help of political and government leaders. These are some of the, the dilemmas for the Russian Orthodox Church today. Uh, since the fall of communism, the capacity to have Orthodox education, parochial schools, and even an Orthodox university in Moscow, St. Tihans, where uh, my wife and I were based in 2011 and 12. So, Magnificent opportunities, the, the rector of the uh, university, Father Vladimir Vadobyov, and the sense of, of everything we've been able to rebuild, everything we've been able to restore, all these opportunities that have been given back to us since the fall of communism. At St. Tihans, not only men, but also young women study and also study theology even though in the Orthodox tradition only men can become priests. And the churches. Uh, this is the, the church that 
Deb, my wife and I attended in, in Moscow when we were on leave there. This is at Christmas time, so the churches aren't always this full, but they are sometimes this full. There aren't enough churches in Moscow for the huge population. These uh, are people preparing to come forward for, for communion. The way uh, the Eucharist is served in the Orthodox Church, you come forward and the priest uh, has a large chalice. Bread has been, pieces of bread have been mixed into the wine and he takes a spoon and places this mixture into uh, the worshiper's mouth. But you, you get this sense of this renewal of orthodoxy and uh, the, the, not only the old men and women, right? I mean, this is, now you see the, the young people and the families and the children, all of this again possible since 1991 and the fall of communism. But this, this alliance, this close alliance between Kirill and Putin has also come at a cost. And that's what we're now seeing during the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because what may be good for the Russian Orthodox Church has not always been good for Ukrainians. This is Metropolitan Anufri. He is head of the Patriarch's churches in Ukraine. So those 30, 37,000 parish that the Russian Orthodox Church now has, 12,000 out of 37,000 are in Ukraine. 12,000, nearly a third, and, and nearly half of the monasteries are in Ukraine. When the Russians invaded, Patriarch Kirill essentially blessed the war against Ukraine, but his representative in Ukraine, Metropolitan Onufri, spoke out. He was the only hierarch in the whole Russian Orthodox Church, and he said this invasion of Ukraine by the Russians is repeating the sin of Cain killing Abel. If we are truly brothers and sisters with one heritage, how is it possible that one brother has lifted up his hand against the other? Spoke out against the war, called on President Putin to cease hostilities, and today these 12,000 parishes that he represents have said, we are now fully independent of the Moscow Patriarchate. We are now our own church. So this has been one of the prices of the close cooperation between Kirill and Putin that 12,000 parishes have essentially broken off in resistance to the war. Just as, as Putin may have miscalculated thinking that the Russians would be welcomed as liberators in the Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine, that turned out not to be true. Even Russian-speaking Ukrainians think of themselves as Ukrainians in the same way the Moscow Patriarchate churches want to be Ukrainian churches, churches that serve the Ukrainian people. All right, and then finally, uh, now turning to the second part of our reflections, how do we respond to all of this as Christians? What kind of theological resources do we have to frame war and the way that Christians should respond to war? So I'm going to walk through several of the major options that have developed in Christianity, especially uh, uh, We'll see in a moment several 20th century theologians, but first we go back to the Middle Ages, to the 13th century, to this man, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval Catholic theologian drawing on the thought of the 5th century theologian, Augustine of Hippo, articulated for Christians what we call a natural law tradition and a way of thinking about war out of the resources of both Christianity and human reason. So this natural law tradition talked about the possibility of a just war. There can be for Christians something like a just war. Of course, our Savior, Jesus Christ himself, turned the other cheek, went to the cross, refused to resist, and so there's always been a strong pacifist strand in Christianity. 
But over the centuries, we also developed this natural law approach, this possibility of a just war. The 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, says, Thomas Aquinas says, basically, a just war depends on these three factors. There has to be a just cause. And if one nation has been invaded and is aggressively attacked by another nation, if the life, the existence of the Ukrainian nation is in jeopardy, there is a just cause to fight back. There has to be a proper authorization. So we can't just say this spontaneously as individuals. A war has to be authorized by its government. And then third of all, the war needs to be conducted with the right intention. The right intention is to restore the peace, to preserve the integrity of the nation that's been attacked. And so if this were applied to the war between Russia and Ukraine, the intention would not be to destroy Russia, but to defend Ukraine, to protect Ukraine, right intention is also important. Since the time of Thomas Aquinas, other Christian theologians have added these factors, a reasonable chance of success, war as a last resort, and the means have to be proportional to the ends. In other words, using nuclear weapons would be out of the question because the devastation would not be proportional to the end of restoring peace. So a great deal of thought that Christians have put into the just war tradition. But in the 20th century, some other interesting options as theologians began to reflect on the events of World War II. This man, this great reformed theologian, Karl Barth, who uh, from Switzerland spent most, the beginning of his life teaching in Germany, was involved with the, the movement in Germany that was resisting Hitler. He, uh, Barth was the principal author of the, the Barman Declaration, one of our confessions as Presbyterians. And Barth had a different way of thinking about war. Barth said, well, Christians need to discern whether there's a specific command from God to go to war. Not think about just war through our human rationality, but listen for a living word of God. So Barth framed it this way, we shouldn't go to war unless we've been working ahead of time for peace not only between nations, but also for peace within our own nation. Have we looked at ourselves? Have we looked at what our motivations may be? Because sometimes nations go to war to solve their own internal problems rather than to really bring about a just peace. Secondly, there has to be a conviction that the very existence, in this case, of the Ukrainian nation is at stake. Does the nation still have a call from God to exist? Because it has particular gifts to offer the world. Is there something distinctive about Ukrainian national identity? Is there something distinctive about Ukrainians and what they have to offer the world? In a way, this is the, the struggle within Ukraine itself. Are we a distinctive people? Do we have a distinctive history, a distinctive gift to give to the rest of the world? through our heritage, our culture, and so on. And then third of all, an uncompromising commitment to fight regardless of the prospects for success. Very interesting that, that from Bart's point of view, if a nation has really heard the command of God, it will throw everything into the effort, not worried about calculating success. Well, in, in some ways, at least some of these criteria have been fulfilled by the, the Ukrainian people, at least the Ukrainian leadership. Uh, certainly, there have been years and years of trying to work out diplomatic solutions with Russia. There is this conviction that Ukraine is a distinctive nation with distinctive gifts. And certainly, we've seen from the Ukrainian side a great commitment to throwing itself into the war even though the, the chances for success at the beginning seem quite remote. 
Another perspective uh, in the 20th century was that of Reinhold Niebuhr, one of our great American theologians who uh, thought a great deal about politics and Christian involvement in politics. He spoke of Christian realism and that history is always an arena of tragic compromises. When we think about what this might mean for Ukraine, I, I think that, that, you know, as Americans, we always are thinking about justice. And justice means fairness. And the Ukrainians should get what is fair for them. Reinhold Niebuhr would be more circumspect and say, life is not fair. The Ukrainians may not get what is fair to them. Tragically, history is a place of tragic compromises. And we've heard some of this also in, in the West. I don't know if you followed the, the paper, the, the great economic conference that takes place every year at Davos, Switzerland. And this year, beamed in via Zoom was Henry Kissinger, 98 years old, still thinking about world politics. And this is the very position that Kissinger took. Kissinger said, you know, we have to be realistic. And even though the, the fair thing would be to go back to the way things were before the invasion, that's not the way that history and politics works. There would be tragic compromises. Well, one other perspective, and that is uh, the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, H. Richard Niebuhr, not as well known uh, to a wide American audience, but for many years a professor of theology at Yale Divinity School, very thoughtful as a theologian. And he and his brother sparred uh, during the 30s and 40s about war and the American involvement in war. In the 1930s, when the Japanese invaded Manchuria, H. Richard Neva wrote a very provocative article, essay called The Grace of Doing Nothing. And he didn't mean passivity by that, but he said, before, from a Christian perspective, before we engage in war, there are things we have to think about. So first of all, examining our own selfish national interests. You know, with all the rhetoric about protecting Ukraine and how the Russians are authoritarian and dictatorial, it's very easy for Americans not to think about where our own selfish national interests might be playing a role in this war. How is it good for us that Ukraine be pro-Western? How is this good for our military industrial complex? How is this good for evading, well, you know, it finally caught up with Boris Johnson, but I was thinking for a while, the one thing that saved Boris Johnson for so long was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he could keep going to Kiev and, you know, kind of making it as a politician a little bit longer. Selfish national interest can also be a factor in war. Have we really examined ourselves? Uh, secondly, H. Richard Niebuhr thought that as Christians, we always, first of all, should be seeking nonviolent forms of resistance, things like economic sanctions rather than military force, diplomatic pressure, and so on. And maybe the most interesting but, but elusive is waiting to see where God is at work to bring forth new possibilities for reconciliation. H. Richard Niebuhr was convinced that as awful as war is, as tragic, God is always doing something new. And will we have the eyes to see it? Will we be looking as Christians for those places where there might be possibilities for breakthroughs? to think about a relationship with Russians in a different way, to think about the balance of power of the world in new ways, to find ways that Christians can, can reach across borders and hostilities, not just to fuel an ideological justification for war, but to, to rise above those selfish national interests. They will always play a factor. Christians cannot ignore them. But where are the unique opportunities to which God might be calling us? So I'll end and then uh, welcome questions and comments. 
with this marvelous mosaic, which is in some ways in the, what we might call the mother church of Russian Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy in the Slavic world. This is in the church of St. Sophia in Kiev, uh, the, the, the church that was constructed after Prince Vladimir's conversion, the, the mother church that from, from whence Orthodoxy spread also into Russia. In the apse, this, the one that, that the Orthodox call the mother of God, the mother of God who is praying, lifting her arms in prayer. Every day, as Russians kill Ukrainians and Ukrainians kill Russians, the mother of God is weeping and praying and crying out for her children to return to that vision of a transfigured world of heaven on earth. So let me end there and welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, the pale of Jewish settlement was almost entirely in Ukraine. Do you see influences from the Jewish culture on how Ukraine is different perhaps than the rest of the Russian Empire? Okay, e excellent, excellent question. Very interesting. So, if over the centuries, Russian identity evolved very much in the direction I've been describing, Orthodox culture, Orthodox heritage, one people, everything going back to 988. That's been one part of the Ukrainian story, but Ukraine has also been because of these various historical cultural influences from the outside, Ukraine has always been much more culturally pluralistic and therefore religiously pluralistic. And this has become part of Ukrainian identity where Ukrainians say we're different from Russians because we have this tradition of different religious groups working peaceably together. Now that's not always been the case. You know, there was a, a terrible persecution of Jews during the Second World War by the Nazis, but also by Ukrainians who allied themselves with the Nazis. Uh, so uh, terrible, millions of deaths of Jews in Ukraine. But since 1991, since the independence of Ukraine, there has been a good tradition of different religious groups working together. One of the ironies of history is that we now have at least three Vladimirs. We have the Vladimir of 988, we have Vladimir Putin in Russia, and the president of Ukraine is Vladimir Zelensky. And Vladimir Zelensky himself is a Jew, married to a woman who has been part of the Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate. So his very marriage illustrates some of the religious pluralism that has made Russia a bit different from, uh, has made Ukraine a bit different from Russia. Also, uh, evangelical Christians have had a much stronger presence in Ukraine than in Russia, have been very active even now socially. I was just reading that Mariupol, that, that place on the Black Sea that the Russians uh, have now occupied, at times when the Red Cross was unable to get humanitarian aid into Mariupol, there were evangelical Christian groups bringing humanitarian aid. So, different dynamic in Ukraine. So we have a couple questions back here. Thank you very much. A very quick disclaimer, my friends who know me know that I've been blessed my whole life with generous tears. So if I flow tears, you've been warned, okay? Uh, it was my privilege, along with my husband, to live and work in Moscow from 91 to 94, uh, during the time of the dissolution of the of USSR into the Commonwealth of States. I had boldly asked the Lord to give me opportunities in one-on-one -on -one relationships to lead people to Christ. He honored that, and for that I give him all glory. One of my questions in response to your title of your program is, what difference might we now expect or see or realize within individuals within the Orthodox Church. My experience when I came there was that as I came to know people, 
uh, on an individual personal basis. I was the director of nursing, the first director of nursing of the American Medical Center, and so had opportunity to work with young Russians in a professional setting. But as I came to know them, their heart hunger to move from that institutional experience of knowing God to the personal one. My first experience was at a conference surgeon I went to under World Vision's banner on business. And the woman who was the translator, Irina, she leaned over to me at lunch and she said, do you know God? I said, I do. She said, well, I want to know God. I need to know God. And for a year, we mentored and spent time together. My question is, have we seen a movement uh, in both Russia and Ukraine for people to know God on the personal level and not just the institutional church level? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. So, you know, it, it's complicated. It, it, this reminds me of sometimes people ask me, do you think, do you think President Putin's really a Christian? <laughs> and I, 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 I can't look into people's hearts, right? None of us can, and, and so it's so hard to know what's going on in individuals' hearts. But I, I so, I, I'm so moved by your question because this has been our experience too. We know so many Russians and some Ukrainians individually and their own spiritual longings and struggles. What we have found is that the war, probably like all wars, polarizes people. Our Russian friends are all over the place. And so uh, some still believe very much in the institution and preserving the institution's power. But let me tell you another story that, that I think uh, captures some of the, 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 the emotional turmoil. Uh, the dilemmas that individuals find themselves in. So in this town of Belgorod, 20 miles from the Ukrainian border where we were based at the big state university there, and we got to know uh, a man, uh, I'll call him Roman, and he uh, is Ukrainian, and actually his wife and son live in Kharkiv, which is right across the border in Ukraine, only about an hour away on the train. But he lives in Belgorod, teaches at the university in the seminary there, and cares for his elderly mother. So when the war broke out, he was in Belgorod in Russia. His wife and son were in Kharkiv. And he lost contact with them for a couple of weeks. They were sheltering in a basement, no cell service, no electricity. Middle of the night, he sent me a text he said, it's the happiest day of my life. My family is safe. And I thought, well, this is marvelous. Somehow they got out of Kharkiv back to him in Russia. Two weeks after that, he sent me a photo. And he said, here's my son in Bavaria. Scratch my head. Well, it turned out that his family had been allowed to flee, but could not flee back to Russia took a train, standing room only, 14 hours, one of the last trains to leave Kharkiv, across the nation, eventually to Poland, and then on into Germany. Will he ever see his family again? What will happen? What will be the, the fate of this particular family? And here he is teaching religion at the State University and the local seminary. He's a Ukrainian. He loves his country, but he lives in Russia, cares for his mother. How will he make sense of this? And when I text him back and I say, do you feel some emotional support from your colleagues? He doesn't answer. So, so many different individual fates and how people will respond to all of this. There are places where I do see some movement. So one example, there'd be many, but the, the Metropolitan of the Russian Orthodox Church in the Belgorod region. Uh, about a week ago, if you were following the news carefully, there was actually a Ukrainian rocket attack on Belgorod. Presumably three rockets were shot down and the remnants of one rocket landed in a residential area and killed five people who happened to be refugees from Kharkiv. 
And the Metropolitan, the official representative of Kirill, of the Russian Orthodox Church, immediately issued a statement saying, it's time for peace. What has happened to the Ukrainians has now come back and hit us. Now that's a remarkable statement. A remarkable statement, as limited as it is. Someone saying within the Russian Orthodox Church, this cannot be the case. Things must change. The larger question, will this lead to a spiritual transformation in Russia or Ukraine? So hard to know, so hard to know. But it is, I think, the essential question because Patriarch Kirill likes to say 70% of Russians are Orthodox. You talk to a village or town priest, he'll tell you, fewer than 1% of Russians regularly go to church. So there's this very ambiguous attitude toward the church, the spiritual longing that you're describing, yet the suspicion of the institutional politics. There are, are sometimes, I think to myself, um, if this war could teach the hierarchs that Christians are actually a minority in Russia and that the church has work to do on the ground to bring about that kind of spiritual transformation, that would be a blessing. Be a blessing to learn that you're a minority, not an imaginary majority. We've got another question here, and we're running out of time. So, okay, so I've got to be quick. Yes, as a Ukrainian American and a Christian, I was intrigued by the title of your presentation, How God is at Work in the War in Ukraine. When you consider the enormous suffering, the deaths, particularly in Ukraine, could you say a little bit more how God is at work? in practical terms, in this war affecting the lives of, of people, particularly of people, rather than the state. Yeah. So one just very quick example. I have pictures of an evangelical pastor loading up his van with groceries, going out to a village after the, the Russians had withdrawn. And there are pictures of these elderly women They've been through so much. They grew up during the war, Second World War. They suffered under communism. And they bring their plastic bags, and he loads them up with cans of groceries. That is one place where God is at work. Just the simple acts of Christians caring for those in need. That doesn't make the front pages of the newspapers, but those are places where God is surely at work. I think, boy, John, thank you so much. What a, an important, and yeah. <laughs> Friends, as we move towards worship today, would you join me as we close in prayer? Oh, gracious God, uh, each of us has thoughts and emotions about uh, this terrible situation in Ukraine. And many of us probably uh, have similar thoughts as others, but they're not all the same. And some of us just were, how can you be in this at all? Um, and yet there are these stories. And we, also might even feel paralyzed to what we might do. Um, Lord, may this draw us into a conversation with you um, in prayer. And may we do so confident that uh, you will lead us uh, individually and uh, corporately as a congregation into some type of faithful, faith-filled, response. Well, we don't know what that is. Uh, but Lord, may you call us to that vocation. Thank you for John and the work that he does continue to uh, bless and prosper him uh, as he reflects faithfully on um, the situation and uh, as he communicates it to others as he has to us this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.